Thank you all for coming to hear about Krishna. Um, because hearing about Krishna, chanting about Krishna, serving Krishna, but especially with, with the consciousness focused on Krishna, doing something. Uh, this is, as the Devatas will explain in the second chapter of, of the 10th canto, this is the um, para botam. This is the boat that we have to para um, botam mahakritena. This is the boat that the great acharyas have provided, by which we can cross the very ferocious ocean of material existence to somehow or another become absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. In a purport in the, in the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada explains, and he explains this many times, and all our acharyas have said this, that Krishna himself comes for many reasons. Many reasons. But one of the most essential reasons is to perform pastimes so which we can absorb our consciousness in Him. Very interesting, intriguing pastimes. So I would like to humbly request that on this very auspicious day that we don't waste time and we use our time to hear and chant about Krishna's wonderful pastimes. Or, as many devotees have to do, they have to sacrifice their own time for hearing and chanting to, to facilitate, to give a facility um, for others to hear and chant about Krishna and, re and remember Krishna. So those devotees are also very special for making that sacrifice for others. When, when trying to understand or think about where to, to begin the short kata that, that I've been requested to give by very kind-hearted devotees, um, I thought of beginning at the beginning of the 10th canto because the 10th canto, um, of course, is, is the smiling face of Krishna, contains the smiling face of Krishna. The tenth canto is considered the head of Krishna and the Rasalila pastimes are considered the smiling face of Krishna. So this canto is so special, especially powerful and in, in one sense it is the essence of the Srimad Bhagavatam because the Bhagavatam is meant to lead us to Puranarko Dunodita is the light of Kali Yuga that is meant to lead us to the um, to Brindavan, basically speaking, to the wonderful, all attractive pastimes of Krishna in Sri Brindavan Dham. So the tenth canto begins with the words of Mara's Prickit. Because in the ninth canto, after describing thirteen chapters of description of the um, the Sun Dynasty, the descendants of Vaivaswat uh, Manu. Then there are 11 chapters that describe the Soma Dynasty, the Moon Dynasty. And Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur comments in the 10th canto, right in the very opening verses, that although so many incarnations have been described, Beginning in the third chapter, third canto, basically, he describes in the descriptions of the Manu, true sweetness has not been obtained until the pastimes of Lord Ramachandra and Lord Krishna were discussed. Because in the pastimes of Lord Ram, and of course, especially in the pastimes of Sri Krishna, and especially in the pastimes of Sri Krishna and Vrindavan, 
the very intimate exchanges between Krishna and his devotees are described. And this is the cause of sweetness. Uh, uh, Maharaj Prickett will soon say, Nivritta Tashaya Bhagiyamanam Bhavoshada Shotamanam Abhir Abhimanat that these pastimes of Krishna, in his eagerness to hear about Krishna, he says these pastimes of Krishna, they are everything for every kind of person. For someone who is nivritta tashar, who is free from material attachment, these pastimes keep him in the state of freedom from material existence because of the absorption of his mind. And for the sadakas, those who are trying to develop their love for Krishna, these pastimes act as bhava oshud. They are medicine, curative medicine, that bring us our minds, our consciousness, from its absorption in the material world to full absorption in Krishna, in the thoughts of Krishna. And then thirdly, even if an ordinary person hears about Krishna, they feel pleasure. Even if an ordinary person hears the chanting of the holy names, they feel pleasure. And those of us who have participated in chanting of the holy names in Sankirtan on the streets of even a western city where no one knows anything about Krishna, when they've never heard about Krishna. We've seen just people walk by and put their hands in the air and say, I want to dance, I want to dance. I've actually seen that. This is the power of the Shravanam Kirtanam process. So, Maharaj Prickett, after hearing some verses beginning with the sixth in the 50th verse or so of the last chapter of the ninth canto, finally, what Maharaj Prickett has actually been waiting for after hearing nine cantos and being so close to the time of his departure from this world, it is coming to that time when he would hear about Krishna directly. And he becomes so eager. Sukadev Goswami has described Krishna's pastimes in a very, very brief way, an overview way. From beginning to end in just a few verses, he's described the, the, the face of Krishna and its beauty. And he's attracted the mind of Prickit Maharaj. And this is something that we will all have to face one day. And because Mars Prickett is at the verge of leaving this world, at the verge of death, it's such a difficult time. And the mind can be so easily disturbed, it will be disturbed by the bodily discomfort. How much we have to practice in life to focus our consciousness on Krishna Ante Narayana Smriti. How much we have to practice our life regardless of what we are doing in our life. Regardless of what our service is. We have to practice focusing our mind on Krishna. Mam Anusmara Yudhicha Krishna tells Arjuna. We have to connect Whatever we are doing to Krishna consciously, Krishna consciousness, consciousness of Krishna. So, after hearing the pastimes of Krishna, spoken in brief and Baladev in brief, and if you haven't read this and Srila Prabhupada's purports, on that end of the ninth canto, you should really do that. They are very powerful. They are very extremely sweet. So when Parikit Maharaj hears 
a brief summary of the pastimes. He simply wants more and more and more and more and more. He wants to hear more about Krishna. Happy to see. He doesn't think, okay, what's next? He thinks, I want to hear more and more and more. He says, and he begins asking questions. He, he recites that Nivritta Tasha verse, Upagiyam Anam Bhavosadam. He recites that verse, and then he asks questions. Tell me about Krishna's birth. Why did he leave Mathura and go to Vrindavan? And, and also because he's explained this, Sukadeva has explained this earlier. Why does he go to Dwarka? Why does he marry so many queens? How many did he marry? Why did he do this? Why did he do that? I want to hear about everything. He was so attracted. He was so attracted. And Sri Sanatana Goswami in one comment, he says he is, that, that he is called um, Satama. Um, because his attraction to Krishna was increasing constantly. It was unceasing. It did not stop and it was increasing constantly. He just wanted to become absorbed in thoughts of Krishna and Krishna's service at this most difficult time of his life. So he even says to Srila Sukadeva Goswami, Maharaj Prikit says that tell me everything that I've asked you, answer these please, and answer everything that I haven't asked you. I just want to hear about Krishna. Tell me everything about Krishna. Like in the, in the, ne in the Bhakti Samatha Sindhu Nectar Devotion, there's, or it's actually from Jugal Gita in the 36th, 36, 35th chapter of the 10th canto, that the gopis start saying, Krishna is putting his left his cheek on his left hand as he's, he's resting on it. For them, they're, they're creating a picture of Krishna in their mind as they talk to each other. They every, because they have love for Krishna, because they have rag, absorbed attachment to Krishna. Every little detail about Krishna bring such happiness to their heart and they want more and more and more. This is actually the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu. Mahaprabhu showed the perfect example of full absorption in thoughts of Krishna. His followers, the Goswamis, and all the followers absorb somehow or another Somehow or another, everything will be accomplished by the mind's absorption in thoughts of Krishna. Through service, let me do this for Krishna's pleasure, for Krishna's servant's pleasure, Prabhupada. But the connection should be there in our minds. Otherwise, we become just absorbed in the mind, thoughts of the mind, all day long. All day long, the mind, the mind, I think this and I think this and I should have said this. This is like a torture for the soul. There's much that can be said about that, but at another time. So after Maharaj Prikit expresses his deep eagerness, Sukadev Goswami is so encouraged that he begins the story, the pastime, the leela of Krishna's advent. And where does he begin? He begins at the ocean, or even before the ocean of milk, with Bhumi Devi. Bhumi Devi in distress because of all the demonic forces that have overpowered the earth, causing trouble to the earth. She goes to Lord Brahma, Lord Brahma and the Devatas, they go to the um, Chir Saga, the ocean of milk. And very interestingly, even Lord Brahma, at this time, our charges explain, 
has never seen Krishna before. But yet he is the one who has to pray for Krishna to come. So based on Shastra, based on Shastra, they begin, the Devatas and Brahma begin to recite the Purusha Shukta and suddenly only Brahma can hear in his, the depth of his consciousness because his heart is pure, his desire is strong. Although he has never seen Krishna, he hears Krishna's voice, Lord Chiradakshai Vishnu's voice in his heart so clearly. And he says, I am already aware of the distress on earth and I am coming. I am coming. So interestingly, he is coming. He was already aware, but yet the devatas had to pray. But Krishna was already coming. So there are so many different levels of existence. We have our own level of existence that we're absorbed in, like an ant walking around Pipra. How do you? What is the Hindi? is Bengali or Hindi? Bengali. You are Bengali? Oh, very good. How do you say in Hindi? So, an ant is thinking that, oh, what I'm doing is everything. Um, I have such important work to do. Or sometimes we see dogs walking from here to there with such absorption in their important work. And we are at least I am just like that most of the time, thinking oh, everything I'm doing is important, everything depends on me. But there's another level of existence, and that's the Devata level. But yet, and there are so many people who like that level of existence too. Most people like thinking I'm doing everything and there's nothing more to existence than my own mind, practically speaking. And then there are people who, before they do anything, they'll consult their astrologer and find out what the devata influences are. And they're thinking on that level. But Krishna says that I am already aware of this. Tatenu kampam susamikshamano. This is the level that the devotees focus their mind on. That yes, Krishna is there, I'm trying to serve him to the best of my ability. I'm so weak, I'm so unfortunate, my mind is filled with so many, but I have faith in Krishna's mercy, not in my own ability, not in the devotees, but I have faith in the kind-hearted softness of Krishna, who is aware of everything. And therefore the prayer of the devotees is primarily, how can I serve you? This is the fixity of their mind. How can I please you? How can I please you? Even though I have so many poor qualities, please let me serve you. Please let me, uh, please accept me as your servant. So the devatas all get instructions through Brahma, through Guru Prampara, that Krishna is coming and that they should advent themselves to participate in his pastimes. They should come, advent, take birth and participate in his pastimes because they are devotees. Then the scene changes. Sukadev Goswami then explains the tattva about Mathura, that it is traditionally, this Mathura is traditionally such a special place, beginning with Shatrugna um, and, and King Sura, Surasena. It is such a special place and in that special place, 
in that special place, one day, Vasudeva is with his newly wedded wife, whose name is Devaki. And our Acharyas also say, Yashodamaya was also known as Devaki, was on a chariot. And who was driving that chariot? Kamsa. And try to see this picture in your mind. There was such a festive occasion. They were on the chariot. There were hundreds of chariots surrounding them. There was bugles, there was music, there were drums, there were kettle drums. There were elephants and horses and the atmosphere was so festive. So festive and suddenly, suddenly, and Kamsa's heart was melting in his affection for his cousin sister, Devaki. <coughs> he was feeling so much affection and suddenly, as we all know, there was Asherita Vak. Just a voice came from the sky in the midst of all this festivity and happiness and that voice said, called Kamsa, a Buddha. You are a fool. Because there you are, happily driving the chariot of your sister and newly married brother-in-law, but you don't know that this Astama Garba, the eighth child, in the womb is going to be the cause of your death. And there you are driving the chariot so happy. Now the word Garba has many meanings. It can mean son, and that's how Kamsa took it. The eighth son will be the cause of my death. It can mean embryo in the womb. It can mean child. <coughs> But in any case, Kamsa was holding the reins of the chariot in his left hand and he was holding a whip to drive the horses in his right hand. And as soon as he heard that sound, his entire mood changed. No longer was he the affectionate um, brother of his completely dependent sister. No longer he was happy. But as soon as he was threatened, as soon as he felt that something wasn't going to go in his favor, the Asura, Asura Bhav came out. Sometimes I'm also like that. I'm acting like such a nice devotee and then someone pushes me or something like that or someone does something I don't like. And then, Arr! But he was really in a sura. So his whip was in which, which hand? Yes, I was just tricking you and you caught my trick. His whip was in his right hand. The reins of the horses were in his left hand. He dropped the reins of the horses. He grabbed Devaki with his left hand by her hair, her sanctified hair on this auspicious day. And with his right hand, he pulled out his sword. And this was going on in the middle of a festival. And everyone was watching him. He was so shameless. And he was about to kill her. And Vasudev, and if one reads the Bhagavatam, both in the 11th canto and in the 10th canto, when Vasudev is discussed, he's such a scholar, he's so intelligent, he's so pious, he's so pure. Immediately, he decides, I have to somehow save her. Of course he has to decide this. He wants to avoid unnecessary bloodshed as well. 
Because if Kamsa did that, then Maharaj Devaka, who was there, he would immediately attack with his armies and everyone. It would be, it would be terrible. So he decided, I will save the situation. I will try. It was his duty. He had to do it. Jai Gopal Prabhu Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. So happy to see you. Huh? No, no. To see Gopal brings us happiness. That's we're talking about Kamsa. Oh, demons, so you're talking about yeah. me. Yes, yeah, so therefore we're relieved from our mind. So Vasudev starts preaching to him. Basic, in one sense, basic Bhagavad Gita philosophy. You are not your body. But he explains it in a very practical way. He explains that just as the, the worm, in, the caterpillar goes from one leaf to the next, and before he lifts his body from this leaf, before he goes to that leaf, he's sure about what his steadiness on the second leaf before he goes from the first leaf. So similarly he explains that you are eternal. You are eternal. You are a soul. You should be very careful what you do in this life because what fills your life, what fills your consciousness, adhishtya manas chayam visayopasevate, what fills your consciousness at the time of death, that will carry you to your next life. Be careful. You commit this sinful activity now on the suspicious time. Your own sister in front of everyone. At the auspicious time of her marriage. You kill her. What sin is going to come to you? What your consciousness is going to be filled with? This is a very important point. That we should fill our consciousness properly. And we should be, and this is described later in Srila Prabhupada's purport about when the, um, the, six children, the six garbers in the womb of Devaki are killed mercilessly by Kamsa one after another. Um, Srila Prabhupada follows the, the comments of Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, but he gives another special, something very special. He says, that we should be afraid of kam kod lob moha mada matsarja. We should be afraid of these things. We shouldn't be casual about filling our consciousness with these very dangerous elements. We should fear that because they will steal away the priceless gift of bhakti that we have been given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Nityananda Prabhu, by Srila Prabhupada, by Guru, by Vaishnavas, by their, this is so rare, it is so rare, so we should guard this creeper, changing the metaphor, this, from the Upasakagan, Laba pra, Pratishtadi Upasakagan, Laba Puja Pratishtadi Yata Upasakagan. We should be very careful in our Krishna consciousness. That wasn't exactly how Vasudeva was preaching to Kamsa, but this is how Prabhupada will preach to us a little bit later in the Bhagavatam. So he told Kamsa, you should even give up present happiness for the future. Even if you do get killed, it is better than committing this terrible sin. You will, by, saving your, by killing Devaki, you will save yourself for the present. But your future is very dark and gloomy. But Kamsa 
did not get touched by the philosophy. After all, asura means rajatama. Sattvagun means the mind sees things, the intelligence sees things clearly. So Kamsa wasn't, didn't put down his sword. But Vasudeva, after thinking for some time, he, please, the Bhagavatam is so wonderful. Please study the Bhagavatam. It is full of every kind of knowledge. It is so powerful. So Vasudev began thinking, one really never knows what the future is going to bring us. So let me save the present. So he makes a promise to Kamsa. A promise that is very astounding. He uses the, the word... Um, he says, I will give you all my children as they are born one after another. You have nothing to fear from Devaki. It's the Astama Garba, the eighth child you have to fear. And I will give you each and every one of the children. I will present them to you one after the next. And you can do with them as you like. And Vasudev was known as a completely truthful person. And Kamsa knew that he would never lie. He always would protect his word. And Prabhupada explains in the, in the purport that the devotees should also be truthful in this way. So honorable that everyone will believe everything they say. And actually, if one speaks the truth, there's two sides of this, of course. There's an old American Indian saying that if one's, one who speaks the truth, not an Indian Indian, but American Indian, one who speaks the truth needs a very fast horse nearby. It's funny, yes? <laughs> but on the, on the other side, if one speaks the truth, <laughs> Um, one words become very powerful. So even Kamsa trusted Vasudev's word. So at this point, after hearing that, that I, and it was basically selfishness. There was no compassion for Devaki or Vasudeva or the children. It was just motivated by selfishness. This is a hankara. This is the result of false ego, living in false ego, not being um, gopi bhata para kamalewa dasa dasa no das. But if we have false ego, if we are living in the land of false ego, with no saranagati, we will always be simply selfish. Kamsa was thinking, in this way, I could save my life if I, if I kill the eighth child and I don't have to kill Devaki because if I kill Devaki, there'll be so much more sin attached. She's my sister. This is at the auspicious time of her wedding. So therefore, because my needs will be met, I will put away my sword. And Vasudev was happy. Kamsa went to his home, and Vasudev went to his home. After the first child was born, as everyone knows, Vasudev, his name was Kirtiman, he brought that child to Kamsa, and Kamsa's heart again became soft. And he said to Vasudev, it's the eighth child that I have to fear. You are so truthful. You are so honest. You're bringing me the child to do anything with.
You please take him. I have nothing to fear from this child. You please take him. Take him. I will spare him. And Vasudev was so thankful, but he already knew that he couldn't trust Kamsa. And Prabhupada explains why. It's because Kamsa had very bad association, always giving him bad advice. And this proves to be true again and again and again. So Vasudev goes home very happy, but knowing the situation is not fully stable or trustworthy. And then something amazing happens. And what is that amazing thing? Who comes? Narada Muni. Everything is peaceful, everything is happy, and Narada Muni comes. Huh? Instigator, yes. But instigator on behalf of, he's Bhakti Shakti. So he instigates on behalf of Bhakti Devi. And everything Narada Muni does, we know, is good and wonderful. Um, in the notes on this chapter, Srila Prabhupada puts in an, a verse that's not directly in the Bhagavatam, but it's included in the commentaries um, of, the, of the Madhva line. And he explains that Narada Muni didn't enter the palace of Kamsa, but he was outside in a garden, and he sent a messenger, and he was glowing like a thousand suns. And he sent a messenger to Kamsa, saying, I have come, I'm here. If you want to see me, I'm here. So Kamsa was so happy that Narada Muni had came to visit him. And this happens again later also. Because Narada Muni wants the Leela sped up. He wants the Leela sped up. And if Kamsa is always in a happy mood, it will not happen quickly that Krishna appears. And this point, um, I don't want to interrupt the pastime right now, but this point is so important um, in understanding Srila Prabhupada. He will do anything to accomplish his mission because his motives are pure and he's a servant. So Narada Muni, Kamsa comes with a golden throne and places it in the garden and he worships Narada Muni. And Narada Muni says, I am very pleased with your reception. And this information also comes from the Harivamsa. I am very pleased with your reception. And because I'm very pleased with you, I want to tell you something. That on my way here, I saw something very wonderful. It has to do with your enemies, the Devatas and their plans. Would you like to hear this? And Kamsa says, yes, please tell me. And Narada Muni says, as I was coming, I passed through Sumeru and the Devatas, headed by Lord Brahma, were having a meeting. And you know what they were talking about? Do you know what they were speaking about? They were speaking about killing you that they were taking their birth in the Yaru dynasty and in the surrounding areas. And they were planning, they were plotting, they were scheming to kill all the Asuras. And you are the head of the Asuras. I have to leave now. <laughs> and he left.
Khamsa became very fearful. And he called for Vasudev. And he said, bring me that child that I spared. He killed him. And year after year, as Vasudev and Devaki gave birth to one child after the next, Kamsa, ah, in his fear, killed them one after another. He didn't want to take any chance. He knew that the Devatas had said that the eighth child, Astamagaba, would kill you. But he thought, now that they're plotting against me, and they are very clever, any of the children of Vasudeva and Devaki may be the cause of my death. At that time, the story, the pastime, the Leela shifts again to Krishna instructing Yoga Maya. And there, these very wonderful purports given by Srila Prabhupada and Srila Vishnu of Chakravati Thakur uh, in that section where he describes the eight children being killed. Of course, there's a long pastime about that of them being the sons of Marichi and, and Harani Kashipu cursing them. Do you know why he cursed them? This really shows what false ego does. They wanted to become, who did Harani Kashipu worship to become powerful? Lord Brahma. So these sons of Maharishi, they wanted to become powerful. And who did they decide to worship? Lord Brahma. And when Harani Kashipu heard about that, he said, He said, you are worshipping someone other than me? You dare worship someone other than me? I curse you. You will be killed by your own father. Their father was Kalanemi at that time. Kalanemi became Kamsa and killed him, and killed them one after the next. So there's always a higher level above what's going on. And again, when just this morning I heard Prabhupada say when describing this, these pastimes in Krishna Leela, why Krishna came. He came, he said, because of his desire. And then he added, he said it again, because of his sweet desire, his sweet desire. So, Krishna then instructed Yogamaya that the, the seventh child would be Baladev in the womb of Devaki. And then he instructed Devaki, excuse me, the, the eighth Yogamaya to, to attract that child to the womb of, of Rohini. And then Krishna said that I will take my birth the supreme, all-powerful Lord, who is everywhere, I will take my birth. And then you take your birth, as will be explained later, Vishnu Anuga. Anuja, as the younger sister of Lord Vishnu. So this also is a very interesting topic that we won't discuss now. And then what happens is Krishna enters the mind of Vasudev and Vasudev becomes fully effulgent in the prison of Kamsa and then he is transferred, Krishna is transferred into the, into the mind, the heart, 
Sometimes it is said the womb of Devaki and she becomes unlimitedly beautiful because she's carrying in her, within her, he who is unlimitedly beautiful. Just think of what that means, unlimitedly, unlimitedly, unlimitedly beautiful. And she becomes unlimitedly beautiful. And her effulgence fills the entire prison. And Kamsa sees this and becomes extremely worried. And then again he has to make a decision. <coughs> Clearly my death is within Devaki. Should I kill her now? And then he makes his decision, completely selfishly, that if I kill Devaki now, everyone, 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 everyone will criticize me for killing my own sister. Everyone will criticize me for killing a pregnant woman. And also my future will be dark. I will have to go to the greatest of hells for this act. Rather, I will wait for the child to be born and I will kill that child. The devatas know that Krishna has taken birth Raise your hand if you have read the prayers that the demigods, the devatas of Garbastuti, the prayers to Krishna within the womb. Raise your hand if you've read that. Raise your hand if you remember anything from that. <laughs> yes? The Satyam Sloka, the first one. Yeah. But those prayers, I'm not going, I'm going to end now, but I'll just, um, just tell you just one little thing about those prayers, little, little. That this is, practically speaking, these are the instructions that the Davidists are giving us how to enter into Braj, because that's what's going to happen next. Krishna is going to enter Braj. The, he, Sukadev Goswami has said this in the ninth canto, just after being born, he crosses the, the river Yamuna and he goes to Nanda Gokul. Why? So Sukadev explains there, and also Srila Jiva Goswami explains in, in the first verse of the Bhagavatam, Janma, because Krishna is a vigya, which means he knows everything. He knows that his greatest devotees, the residents of Vrindavan, are waiting for him in Braj. And because he is swarat, he's completely independent, he wants to go there. He wants to go and have his childhood pastimes with these greatest devotees. So the Davidas prayers, and there's some more chapters in between as well, but the prayers of the Davidas, they give us the instructions on what to do with our consciousness before we can actually enter into the mood of Vrindavan. So I request that you read these and study them very, very carefully because they are full of such important information. Because we can be in Vrindavan, we could be reading about Vrindavan, we could be associating with devotees, but if our consciousness isn't right, correct, well, I could tell you all about that. It doesn't, you feel something is missing. It's not right. Even though I'm there, I'm just on the surface, not even on the surface. 
So how to get the consciousness correct, how to live in such a way that we are in Vrindavan when we are in Vrindavan, that we are in, we are with the holy names when we are chanting the holy names. That when we are hearing about Krishna, we can actually be there. Of course, this is the Nivritta Tarsha, the higher states. And, but it, and these, these things are always um, bhava oshud. They're always medicinal. But the medicine that the, the devatas give us is very powerful. Okay, thank you very much for your attentive listening. Um, Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Sisi Gonatai ki jai, Sisi Krishna Balarama ki jai, Sri Radha Sarva Sandalalita Vesaka Devi ki jai.